Eric, what's your approach to ESG investing? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jenna. Great to be with you today. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on my role and what we're doing at ClearBridge. Um, we're an equity manager based in New York. We're, we have approximately $190 billion in assets under management. And we've been engaged in ESG investing uh, for decades now. And this aligns with our approach of investing in high quality companies over long time horizons. So we believe that understanding ESG issues is really critical uh, to making informed investment decisions. And we integrate ESG research into our fundamental research process as a result. And so ESG analysis is integrated across the entire firm. And our fundamental research analysts are also responsible for conducting ESG research and rating companies on their ESG attributes. So we have close to 800 proprietary company ratings, and we tend to be a top 20 shareholder in many of the companies in which we invest, which gives us access to management, uh, which is also important as we engage with companies. We also have long holding periods, as I mentioned, which averages about six years across the firm. In the strategy that I co-manage um, with MJ McQuillan, uh, the sustainability leader strategy, uh, we focus on companies that have high quality financial characteristics and also leading ESG profiles. Uh, approximately two thirds of the holdings that we have are our highest ESG rating, which is AAA. Uh, we also look for companies that are addressing global challenges and have holdings that fall under a variety of themes, uh, such as climate change, natural resource efficiency, uh, sustainable food, uh, diversity and economic inclusion. And we have a high conviction, high active share approach, uh, but we also diversify across positions and industries to control risk. And it's a core strategy benchmarked against the Russell 3000 index. And honing in on climate change and sustainability, Derek, what are some of the sustainability themes that you're investing in? And could you share some examples with us? Sure, absolutely. So I think, you know, the, the speech we have hit on a number of very important issues that are top of mind today with ESG investors. And for myself, managing a sustainability labeled product, you know, climate change is obviously something that we care a lot about and our clients do as well. And so, um, you know, we will not invest in any companies that are primarily engaged in fossil fuel extraction or mining or are contributing to uh, climate change in a negative way. And instead we're looking invest in those companies that have clean, renewable uh, sources of energy as you know, the crux of their business model. And so we own companies like Solar Edge and Enphase. Uh, these are technology companies um, that make microinverters and optimizers, which make solar installations more efficient. Uh, we also invest in a company called Brookfield Renewable Energy Partners. It's a utility focused on hydroelectric power which has zero carbon emissions. Um, we also own a recent IPO, a company called Shoals. Um, they make a lot of the electronic components that go into solar systems, and they have a solution that requires less labor than a traditional system, and so they're gaining market share as a result of that. So there's a lot of different ways that, that we can get exposure to this theme. You know, Natural resource efficiency is another area uh, where we have exposure. Um, we own a company called Trex, uh, that makes uh, composite decking. They're the leading company in that particular niche of the market, and they use recycled plastic as a raw material. Uh, they're one of the largest recyclers of plastic in the U.S., even though they're, they're a relatively small company. Each of the decks that they manufacture contain about 300,000 uh, recycled bags that aren't going to end up in the oceans, which is what happens to a lot of, of these products. Um, Autodesk is a software company. They are a leader in design and engineering software and their software incorporates generative design. They use artificial intelligence to create design plans that improve performance and maximize resource efficiency. Um, another theme that we have in the portfolio is sustainable food. A lot of um, people are, are very interested in the source of their food and the impact that it has. Uh, companies like Hain Celestial, uh, which is a food and beverage company focused on natural and organic products that are healthier and have less environmental impact are seeing demand increase as a result of that increased intention to that. Uh, Sunopta, another food company, they focused on sustainable plant-based foods and ingredients. 
They participate in plant-based beverages like soy, uh, almond, oat milk, which is becoming more and more popular, um, as well as frozen fruit. So there's a number of companies that uh, are available to us to invest to express these themes. And uh, they're seeing good demand as a result of you know, changing preferences in the consumer economy. To quickly follow up on that, and Max alluded to this earlier, the Biden administration seems to be friendlier to sustainability issues than the previous administration. Derek, are you seeing this in the sustainability leaders portfolio? Yeah, so as as was alluded to earlier, um, you know, the current administration uh, is certainly more friendly uh, to renewables, for instance, less friendly to fossil fuels than the prior administration. We also see the new administration as being more progressive on a variety of other policy topics as well, uh, which tend to favor companies that embrace ESG principles and that we would be investing in for our clients. You know, as it relates to the environment, I think that's probably, you know, the most obvious example. You know, one of the first things that President Biden did was rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. He signed executive orders to undo a lot of the Trump administration's regulatory changes most of which supported fossil fuels um, over renewable energy. Um, you know, as was mentioned earlier, he set a target to reduce emissions by 50 uh, to 52% by 2030, uh, which is actually double the commitment of the Obama administration. And so the details on a lot of these things are to be determined. Um, and it's unclear you know, what exactly is gonna get to the end line in terms of getting through Congress and the legislative process. Uh, but the federal backdrop for renewables is more favorable than it's been in a very long time. And that has positive impacts for many of the companies that we own that I was just talking about. And of course, there are a number of third party ESG ratings providers, and some investors are concerned with ratings dispersion among them. Derek, what issues does this cause for investors and how do you recommend using third party ESG ratings? Yes, so that, that's a good observation. And, you know, the lack of consistency in third party ratings is one of the reasons that we've decided to develop our own proprietary process. And unlike bond ratings, and I'm sure Josh can appreciate this, um, which tend to be very highly correlated among the various rating agencies, uh, ESG ratings have pretty low correlation in comparison. And this is in part due to just lack of standards on disclosure of ESG issues. Um, We also see that smaller companies that have less resources um, and the ability to gather, analyze and publish data. Um, So ratings will tend to be poor for these types of companies, even though they might be quite good on ESG issues. So, you know, one of the benefits of having scale um, and an experienced group of analysts who are well-versed in both company fundamentals and ESG analysis um, is that we can gather and analyze uh, data to make informed decisions about how companies are performing on ESG and how that can influence uh, the stock price performance of those companies. So I think, you know, investors need to be aware that there are limitations of the third party um, ESG ratings. And, you know, We do subscribe to them um, and in some cases do get value from these providers, but we find that they're best um, to supplement what we are already doing internally and relying really on our own informed judgments about how companies are performing on these metrics. So Derek, what's the value of having an active portfolio while investing in the ESG space? Yeah, so, um, you know, we've, we've touched a little bit upon the third party um, ESG providers and some of the limitations uh, that, you know, are involved with, with their process. And, you know, passives do tend to, to be reliant on them. Um, and so there is things like issues against uh, bias against small caps that, um, that might be prevalent if you're reliant on that type of uh, third party uh, rating provider. Um, Being active, you know, allows us to apply our own ESG framework, which, um, you know, we've spent many years and and decades kind of improving um, and evolving over over many years uh, to where we think it adds a tremendous amount of value in our stock picking uh, process. And so, as I mentioned, we have close to 800 proprietary ratings, and that's based on very deep fundamental research that integrates the relevant and material ESG factors into that process. Um, It also allows us to engage 
uh, with management teams and promote uh, positive change, which could also affect security prices. And so having scale and often being a large shareholder in the companies in which we invest, uh, we can effectuate change, which can be beneficial um, to, to shareholders. Um, being active also allows us clearly to constantly monitor uh, and reshape the portfolio as security prices change, as risks and opportunities emerge. Um, you know, for instance, like there's a very active IPO market right now. And there's a lot of really interesting, innovative companies that are becoming investable, uh, that our active approach lets us kind of sift through these new issues and invest in companies that are earlier in their evolution and have the ability to create a lot of value. Uh, passive products would typically need to wait until such companies are added to a benchmark that they track. And a lot of that value might have already been captured at that time. So that's just you know, one example of, of how being active allows us to be a little bit more nimble in how we can invest in the ESG universe. Derek, how are you engaging with companies in the current environment? Yes, yeah, so I would say in general, our engagements are normally quite company specific. So we're either having focused discussions around ESG issues that are material and relevant uh, for the company in question, or we may be providing feedback um, to companies on areas that we've identified for improvement. Uh, but a number of crises have come together in the past year plus that have led us to engage companies on a few topics ac across the board. And so, you know, I guess starting with COVID, which is probably the most prominent, um, you know, here we want to understand how the pandemic is impacting the business clearly, but also what they're doing to mitigate the impact on their employees, on their customers, on the communities where they operate. Uh, we wrote an open letter last year uh, as the pandemic was first unfolding, outlining our general expectations for how companies would respond to the crisis so that they were really considering all stakeholders and balancing short-term profitability against long-term success and keeping in mind things like reputation and brand equity. And then, of course, you know, the killing of George Floyd also brought about a much more focused attention to issue systemic racism and provided an opportunity for companies to reevaluate uh, their diversity initiatives to ensure that they're providing opportunities to all their employees in an equitable framework. Uh, this led to a lot of discussions with management about their DNI initiatives. Uh, we've always focused on diversity at the management and board level, level uh, but many have paid less attention to the policies that lead to opportunities for underrepresented minorities to position themselves for management um, and board level positions. So we've encouraged companies to embrace policies that provide opportunities for advancement to all employees and to provide greater transparency uh, to outsiders so we can evaluate whether they're making progress on these or not. And then of course, attracting and retaining talent um, from a diversity of backgrounds and perspectives has been shown to add value in myriad ways for companies for companies to be successful and create value. So it, it makes a lot of sense uh, from the business side as well. And then lastly on climate, you know, as the frequency and severity of climate related natural disasters has increased um, and as governments have begun to address climate change more proactively uh, through legislation, regulatory changes, um, corporations need to be very thoughtful about how climate change is affecting their business. And of course, you know, we're encouraging companies to be considering this issue very seriously, making changes where appropriate to mitigate the risk of climate change. Um, in our strategy, we've made the intentional decision not to invest in those companies who are contributing to climate change and instead um, allocate our capital to companies that are tackling the climate change problem. Um, most obvious is avoiding fossil fuel related industries and instead investing in companies enabling renewable energy um, to, you know, to really be a, an important part of um, the future energy sources in the country. Finally, looking at some of the latest ESG developments, Derek, the EU has instituted new rules designed to prevent greenwashing or inauthentic sustainability claims among ESG investment products. Should the U.S. follow suit and what should investors look for when verifying the authenticity of ESG claims? Yes, yeah, so you know, greenwashing is an issue that 
you know, both investors and regulators uh, should be paying attention to, and they are. Um, you know, the SEC is going to be focusing uh, more seriously on climate-related disclosures. It's also going to be examining whether investment product labels um, are accurate and are not misleading, um, and that ESG managers are, are walking the walk uh, when it comes to how they manage products and select investments. And you know, investors can, can verify how robust a process is by you know, digging under the hood a little bit and looking at how experienced uh, the firm is in managing ESG portfolios. Uh, they can look at performance track records. They can examine disclosures about the investment process and how they select investments. And they can look at what the individual holdings are in the products um, that are labeled as ESG products to make sure it makes sense. So, you know, there are a number of things that are being done and um, we expect there to be more activity from the regulatory side to kind of help investors through this process.